access by peripheral short intravenous catheterization is a commonly occurring procedure for many patients. It's estimated that more than 90% of all hospitalized patients receive an intravenous catheter during their stay. This procedure is performed daily by nurses and may often be considered simple and routine. However, this can be an anxious and uncomfortable time for the patient, particularly for young children or patients who have never experienced an IV. If the proper steps are followed and the nurse utilizes aseptic technique, the procedure can be simple and safe. However, we must consider the potential problems that can be encountered, including infection, phlebitis, or infiltration. This program is designed to assist nurses in improving their techniques and skills in obtaining and maintaining peripheral venous access to improve patient treatment and safety, as well as attainment of intended outcomes. Let's take a look at our objectives for today's program. We'll describe at least three factors to be considered when selecting the most appropriate sites for peripheral venous access. We'll identify the process to safely obtain peripheral venous access using a peripheral short intravenous catheter. Next, we'll demonstrate the desired method for inserting and stabilizing the peripheral short intravenous catheter. And finally, we'll describe at least three potential complications associated with peripheral intravenous catheters and methods to prevent them. Be sure to read the written materials that accompany this course. You'll be tested on information from both sources. Before we begin with the first objective, let's briefly discuss nursing practices in regards to peripheral short catheters. Peripheral short catheters are introduced into vascular structures for specific diagnostic reasons. Use of these devices is based on several considerations, including, but not limited to, the patient's diagnosis, medical and physical condition, and characteristics or inherent properties of the prescribed infusion therapy. During the process of acquiring vascular access, the nurse must remember to obtain the patient's consent for the procedure in addition to acknowledgement and agreement to participate in the prescribed infusion therapy. The consent of, and in the case of pediatric patients, his or her assent, is to be recorded according to the healthcare organization's policies and procedures for documentation. This critical information is to be placed in the patient's permanent medical record. In the case of the young patient, for example, under the age of 18 years, or the patient who is not considered competent, the consent of the legally authorized caregiver should be recorded. Many nurses ask what criterion establishes adequate proficiency for skill validation for catheter insertion, care, and maintenance practices. Well, there's no set answer to that question. The availability of learning opportunities, skill and proficiency of the nurse, and regulatory restrictions mandated by state agencies in addition to the employing healthcare organization combine to contribute to overall skill development. Additionally, the professional and the educational background of the nurse will play a part toward overall skill development and procedural competency through appropriate patient assessment and care strategies. Most organizations do permit nurses to attempt peripheral short catheter insertion after attendance at a program with an associated laboratory practicum. Nurses are then observed in the clinical arena for insertion technique and other skill sets necessary for catheter placement and removal, as well as maintenance practices. assessment of the patient's peripheral vasculature will assist the nurse in the site selection process for catheter insertion. Prior to any assessment processes, however, the patient must be placed in a reclining or semi-recumbent position. If the patient cannot be placed thusly, then he or she should be seated comfortably. The upper extremities should be readily visible and accessible for physical examination and possible catheter insertion. There are many pre-existing factors that may affect site selection, which are listed in the course material. However, in this presentation, we're going to discuss the top three factors for site selection. Superficial veins are found beneath the layers of subcutaneous tissue. Although deep veins do accompany arteries, it's the superficial networks that are preferred sites for device insertion. Vein selection is based upon the following assessment criteria. Patient condition, 
age, diagnosis, and activity level, vein condition, size, and location, type and duration of prescribed infusion therapy, and the patient's preference. Vein selection is limited to those of the upper extremities in children of walking ability and older, as well as adults. Veins of choice are the metacarpal and the carpal veins of the hand, cephalic and basilic veins of the arm, and accessory venous structures. Remember that these veins traverse both the ventral and dorsal surfaces of the arm. The names of the veins are important to you as the inserting clinician. You should be able to identify the selected vein as it needs to be recorded in the patient's permanent medical record during documentation. In the neonate and pediatric patients under the age of approximately two years, the external jugular, axillary, long and short saphenous, temporal and posterior auricular veins may also be accessed. The azygous vein is not considered a peripheral vein as it arises as a continuation of the right ascending lumbar vein and terminates in the superior vena cava. Site rotation should be considered in site selection assessments. It is recommended that peripheral short catheters can be changed to new locations every 72 hours. That means you should not only consider the current status of available vascular access, but consider where the next potential site location may be if continuation of the therapy is required. If at all possible, areas to be avoided for site selection are those where flexion occurs, the wrists and antecubital regions. Insulate osmolarity and pH are considerations when selecting the most appropriate vein for cannulation. Note, infusion prescriptions with extreme variations or ranges in osmolarity and pH will necessitate further assessment and evaluation and may require insertion of a centrally located vascular access device or CVAD instead of a peripheral short catheter. When selecting a catheter, there are many things to consider. The selected catheter should fit the needs of the patient and be in concert with the intended prescribed therapy. Products manufactured by different companies have varying specifications and instructions for insertion and use. Always remember to use the smallest and shortest length catheter that will accommodate the prescribed therapy to allow for maximum blood flow around the catheter. It's essential that the nurse be familiar and skilled at the insertion techniques and procedures for the selected catheter. Now that we've learned about the factors to be considered when selecting an appropriate site for peripheral venous access and the safety processes for obtaining peripheral venous access, Let's watch our expert in demonstrating the correct procedure. I'm going to demonstrate for you now uh, the appropriate insertion technique for a, this particular product, but what I want you to see is how we follow through on the aspects of the procedure as a very consistent one, two, three approach. So what I'm going to do now is prepare before, again, before I tell the patient when I'm ready, is I'm going to prepare my equipment so that he won't be waiting for me as I'm trying to fumble around to do the insertion itself that will delay uh, him getting through the procedure. Again, you want to go through this as smoothly as possible with the least amount of discomfort. So I will prepare uh, my uh, cap uh, using saline. It is a non-preserved saline. It is a sterile product. And I will make sure that I do uh, perform a procedure called purging the dead space of the cap, which means that I push my saline into my cap space and it's available and ready for me once I've completed the procedure. The next part is to make sure that I have my uh, start kit available and ready. My start kit, and again I will use the procedure to demonstrate to you the certain components. I'm going to rinse my hands one more time um, to make sure that uh, my hands are clean as much as possible before I start the procedure. I have my gloves ready and I have my catheter ready. 
Now, it is appropriate if you elect to, to start, uh, when you're starting your catheter and you have not infused any medication or solutions, you can uh, use this opportunity to ob obtain blood samples at the same time. This way it saves the patient from an extra venipuncture procedure. I have my tapes available. One of the best... Uh, uh, tools right now to be using for stabilization and that's preventing the catheter from telescoping in and out of the vein once you have placed the catheter is a product that is a manufactured stabilization device. This particular tray doesn't have it, um, but it's one of those devices that prevents the catheter during the life of the catheter from sliding in and out of the vein while the patient's doing normal activities of daily living. Uh, it's a manufactured device. It's got an adhesive foot plate, and it adheres to the skin, and then the adapter of the catheter itself uh, sits on that, place, uh, that foot plate. For now, since I've already assessed my patient, I already know where, in my mind, where I'm going to insert this catheter. Um, be very aware that uh, in some patients, the hair on the arm might impede your visualization or your palpation of a vein. Um, you cannot shave the extremity. You may trim the hair or you may clip the hair, but you cannot shave it because shaving uh, will introduce microorganisms through the skin, and that would also compromise the patient as far as possible catheter-related septicemias. I know that I'm going to use this metacarpal vein on the back of the hand. And I've also prepared my patient by telling him where I'm going to be inserting the catheter. I'm going to prepare the skin in a circular motion with this particular product. And while that's preparing to dry, and remember it takes about 30 seconds or so to do that, I am now going to put on my catheter gloves that were in my tray. And I will put gloves on both hands. Uh, for some reason, blood does not know that it can't spatter around. So you need to protect yourself. Uh, you need to make sure that your hands are protected. Uh, you need to make sure, actually, that there's a drape on the bed so that the bed clothing and the other environment is protected from blood spatter. I now, at this point, am going to flush my catheter. Uh, to make sure that my catheter is patent, to make sure that I have no defects in my product, because I don't want to insert a catheter that may be uh, compromised before I um, get it into the vein. I know my catheter is ready to roll. Again, I'm prepared with this particular product. I have pinched the wings to stabilize my stylet, and now I'm going to tell the patient that I'm ready I will insert the catheter at about a 35 to 40 degree angle. Once I obtain a blood return, I will then drop my hand down to about a 15 degree, degree angle and basically skim uh, the skin surface. I will not contact the skin because, again, I don't want to drag microorganisms into the venous structure. With my non-dominant hand, I am holding the skin and retracting the vein so it does not move around. And I prepare my patient by telling him I'm ready, and on one, two, and three, insert into the vein. And you can see the blood return coming back into the catheter extension. And I just begin to insert my catheter. At this point in time, I will now withdraw my stylet. This is part of the safety mechanism. I don't want to impact um, or cause further damage to the vein, but I want to make sure that I can still insert my catheter by gently inserting into the lumen itself. The patient, I now tell, we're ready, it's in the vein, and I'm also going to reconfirm that by gently aspirating on my catheter to again make sure I have a blood return that does con confirm that I'm within the lumen of the vein. I will flush forward gently and administer some of the saline flush because I don't want the blood products to occlude the catheter, thereby causing me to redo the whole procedure all over again. I remove my catheter syringe, my flush syringe, and still maintaining contact with my patient because I want my patient to know that I'm still available here and that we really haven't quite finished the procedure. Now I put on my 
transparent dressing. The transparent dressing allows you as the clinician to perform daily site inspections. I can see the venipuncture site without uh, taking down dressings and causing further skin uh, irritations with tapes being removed all the time. Um, I can um, also warn the patient um, of what to look for should there be a particular problem with the IV. And this falls under not only your documentation but your patient education pieces. Your patients need to know if something feels wrong in the hand other than the awareness that there's an IV in the hand. They need to know that there is a feeling of redness or heat or anything that's untoward or uncomfortable that they should tell you at the first possible uh, second. When I have finished with this uh, I will secure this to the extremity by using these securement tapes that were supplied in my tray. These are sterile tapes. They were in the kit and that's what they're supplied for is for you to use um, to secure the, the device to the hand. This way the patient now can move around without fear of losing the device or catching it on the bed clothes or clothing. The other th aspect you should do and is uh, provided by this particular manufacturer, it, uh, use a slide clamp. This helps prevent any reflux of blood products back into the catheter itself. When I have finished my procedure, I have to clean up and please remember when you perform a procedure like this there are lots of pieces, lots of components. Uh, be very aware when you're working with the older adults, the geriatric population, and especially when you're working with children in uh, pediatric levels down to uh, newborns, there are a lot of pieces that must be discarded. These pieces uh, are very easily ingested by the smaller patients, so make sure when you clean the area those pieces come with you. Also make sure that the tourniquet is removed off the arm. When you walk into the room, with a tourniquet, you walk out of the room with a tourniquet. So make sure it doesn't get accidentally placed on the patient's, um, left on the patient's arm. The patient, again, needs to be told that your procedure is over with and he can resume his activities. Um, and again, uh, you probably will keep the this device in place for about three days. Um, if, if you need to extend the dwell time of this catheter, you must get a physician's order or you can leave it in according to your own organization's policies and procedures. When it's time to remove such a device, you may use a start kit if you wish. You can certainly use gauze pads if you prefer. But again, standard precautions apply because potentially there is uh, exposure to blood and there could be uh, the issue of bloodborne pathogens. Uh, again, I'm going to rinse my hands before I don my gloves. Um, I'm not going to use all my components in the tray because, again, I'm not going to insert a catheter, but I am going to wash my hands with this alcohol-based gel, start to loosen some of my tapes until I get down to the basement dressing, put on my gloves. This procedure should be definitely a clean procedure. It does not have to be uh, performed as aseptically um, as you did with the catheter insertion because remember this catheter is being removed um, so you don't need to worry about maintaining the device. I'm going to use a gauze pad and keep it hand, handy. And now I'm going to remove this dressing. I lift the catheter extension, which loosens the tape at the base of the extension uh, where it's swedged onto the catheter wings. And then I'm going to stabilize um, the wings so it doesn't pull against the skin. Now there are times where you have patients who may have a very fragile skin or they may have had so much tape uh, adherence that their skin is really sensitive and you don't want to tear the skin. Sometimes what you can do is to use an alcohol based swab and just gently rubbing it against the adhesive backed material will loosen and actually will dissolve some of the adhesive so it will lift off the skin without tearing uh, uh, the skin. 
and tearing of the hair. Some of our patients who are particularly um, hairy have uh, a lot of hair on the extremity. If you make sure that uh, when you remove the tapes, if you roll the tapes to the outside of the arm versus pulling them on the inside, you won't uh, rip the hair and cause a lot of discomfort to the patient. So again, just using the alcohol to dissolve the adhesive will help removal of the dressing material. Always keep your finger or your hand on the stabilizing wings or on the catheter ad adapter so it doesn't uh, move around in the patient's vein. Gently retract on the catheter and remove it. You should tell the patient now that, uh, again, the procedure is completed. When you pull the catheter, always look at the length of the catheter. You recall earlier that we talked about the length of the catheter. I want to make sure that it was truly three quarters of an inch when it was inserted. I want to make sure that it's three quarters of an inch long when I remove it. So again, I just make sure uh, and determine that my length is the correct amount before I discard it. Uh, make sure that there is no problem at the skin site of the patient. And for now, I'm just going to secure uh, this gauze with a piece of tape while I continue to clean up my, uh, my area from pieces uh, and need to dispose of them, of the trash. What I need to tell my patient now is that even though the catheter is out, that uh, there is the potential that bruising could still occur, that uh, there is um, a possibility he could have some tenderness, such as a post device removal phlebitis. That occurs about two to four days after catheter removal, after therapy. But at any rate, I want to make sure that the hand is kept quiet for about a half an hour, that the patient doesn't do any lifting with this hand or with the post-cannulated arm until uh, the half hour has passed. And then probably uh, there will be no further bleeding from the venipuncture site. The course materials detail potential complications associated with peripheral intravenous catheters. In this segment, we're going to continue to discuss systemic complications and finish by discussing methods to prevent complications. Systemic complications are those complications associated with general circulation of the patient. Air embolism is caused by entry of air into the circulation. The patient will experience chest pain shortness of breath, shoulder or low back pain, and anxiety. He may appear cyanotic and become hypotensive with a weak, rapid pulse and may lose consciousness. A loud churning noise will be heard over the precordium. Death may result. Catheter embolism occurs as a result of catheter fracture. The fragment then travels to the heart and pulmonary system, potentially causing disruption of circulation by blocking a vascular structure, either the heart or lungs, which may cause cardiac dysrhythmia and cardiac arrest. Catheter fracture is generally associated with poor insertion technique. Fluid overload and pulmonary edema are conditions that may be precipitated by the presence of excess fluid volume. If not closely monitored, the patient can develop congestive heart failure, shock and cardiac arrest. These conditions are caused by too rapid infusion rates or too much volume within a given period of time. Patients prone to these developments are the neonate and pediatric patients, older patients, and patients with pre-existing renal and cardiac diseases or conditions. Early signs of fluid overload are shortness of breath, cough, increased pulse, dyspnea, wet respirations, and frothy sputum. Enlarged neck veins, hypertension, and moist rawls and periorbital edema may also be evident. Speed shock is a systemic reaction that occurs when a substance is rapidly infused. Patients may exhibit facial flushing, dizziness, and headache. The infusion should be discontinued or slowed immediately. Septicemia occurs when pathogens enter the circulation. The best intervention and prevention is hand hygiene. There are several factors that may contribute to the occurrence of septicemia. Infusion system contamination, container administration set and add-ons such as stopcocks, access ports, 
and extension sets, catheter material, clinical technique and expertise, insertion site selection and preparation, manipulation of the delivery system, dressing materials and application procedures, and the dwell of the catheter. Now, let's take a look at some nursing interventions of the previously mentioned complications associated with infusion therapies. Bruising, skilled nursing technique for catheter insertion, brief tourniquet time, gentle firm pressure to achieve hemostasis after catheter removal, perform frequent site assessments, site rotations every 72 hours or PRN, and documentation in the patient's permanent medical record. Extravasation. Discontinue infusion immediately once noted and remove catheter. Elevate extremity per patient comfort. Provide adequate catheter stabilization at the time of device insertion. Assess catheter skin junction frequently to detect early signs of complication development. Only qualified nurses should administer vesicant therapies. Perform frequent site assessments and documentation in the patient's permanent medical record. Thrombosis. Discontinue infusion immediately once noted and remove catheter. Perform frequent site assessments. Site rotations every 72 hours or PRN. Avoid cannulation of lower extremities and documentation in the patient's permanent medical record. Patient education throughout the infusion process, from consent to initiation of therapy to its completion, is paramount for the successful administration of peripheral infusion therapy. Competent, skilled, and qualified clinicians will ensure that complications will be an unusual occurrence, should they even occur at all. As always, documentation of the prescribed therapy is to be performed at established intervals. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Amy Mitchell for HSTN.